Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, and welcome to episode 75 of the Genealogy Gems Podcast. Thanks so much for taking some time to tune in today. I'm glad to have you here. I'm excited to talk about all the things that are going on in the world of genealogy these days. Um, I've got my hot chocolate here. It's getting cold outside. (laughs) Have you noticed that? And uh, certainly, even here in California, it is. So, got my hot chocolate, looking over what's been going on the last couple of weeks. Um, It's been a busy couple of weeks. Let's see. Well, first and foremost, I am doing the grandma thing. I am... Well, as you know, I'm a grandma-to-be. Uh, December 14th is my oldest daughter's due date, and they are having a little boy, and I'm so excited. I can't believe it, a boy in our family. It's going to be amazing. So I've been doing the grandma thing, getting ready for the baby shower. I'm having the baby shower here at my house, and my other daughters are helping me put it together kind of long distance. They're away at college right now, but they'll be coming home for it. So we've been working back and forth on email. And um, it's going to be Winnie the Pooh. That's a lot of fun because I have been, don't tell her, I've been painting honey pots and um, making decorations and I'm putting together a design for the cake and I'm just really excited. So anyway, that's going to be this week. So I have to get my house clean. (laughs) I was like, do I record the podcast or do I clean my house? Eh, Okay, I'll do both. I'll I'll record the podcast. That always comes first. And uh, I'll have to do some speed cleaning later this week. But um, anyway, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a couple shower and talk about things being quite different than they were decades ago. Um, You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about it. I wonder how long baby showers have actually been around. It'd be interesting to look at the history of baby showers. Certainly when I was having babies, um, it was a girl thing. Just girls came to the shower and we played silly games and that kind of stuff. But it was interesting. My daughter and my son-in-law both said, oh, yeah, we'd like to do a a couple shower, you know, have guys and girls. And, of course, my husband's scratching his head going, why would a guy want to go to a baby shower? But I I guess they do. I know that Vienna and Dave have been to a couple of showers for some of their friends, and it's been, you know, men and women. So things change. I don't know. So I've been trying to come up with games and activities and things that would be of interest To the guys and the girls, we were talking about one we thought would be kind of funny, to make the guys have a big blown up balloon and put it under their shirt and see if they could reach over and tie their shoes without popping it. (laughs) What do you think, ladies? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I quit tying my shoes, I think, when I was six months pregnant. Bill Bill was doing it after that. (laughs) But anyway, we'll see how that goes. It's a new trend out there in what the young people are doing these days. It'll be fun. We'll see. I'll let you know how it goes. But on the genealogy front, I have been doing lots of that as well. Um, I recently went to the Family History Expo in Redding, California. It was awful nice to have a Family History Expo finally in my state. (laughs) Really neat. And it's only about, I don't know, two and a half, three hour drive north of where I'm at. So um, the Redding Expo was great. I think the community was really excited to have a conference like that come to their area And uh, I taught several classes, uh, not only my Google classes, but the Sharing the Joy class, Thinking Like a Private Eye, that one. Um, So it was a lot of fun. Saw lots of of my old friends in the exhibit hall and some new people who were teaching classes. It's kind of fun. When when Holly moves the expos to different locations, you get a chance to also meet some of the local lecturers and get a chance to hear some new presentations and things. So it's always different. It's always getting mixed up, and that was great. Let's see, the next Family History Expo, oh, scheduled for Mesa. I'll be in Mesa, Arizona in January of 2010. Um, that's coming up at the end of the month. I think it's the 22nd and the 23rd. Uh, you can get more information about the Mesa Family History Expo at familyhistoryexpos.com or fhexpos.com. And then after that, shortly after that, in February, it will be the St. George, Utah Conference, which is always a big conference. It's a huge turnout and great. Um, well, of course, Mesa was. Now, Mesa, the first time 
they did Mesa was last year, and that was a huge turnout. Lots of snowbirds down there in Arizona who showed up for that one. So both of those will, I'm sure, prove themselves to be really worth the worth your while. And, oh, I also recently went, uh, after Reading, I headed down to the Hemet San Jacinto Seminar. It was a one-day seminar that they put together to kind of celebrate Family History Month in October. And so I headed down there for a one-day conference, and Vienna came with me, my daughter, who was, you know, seven months pregnant. Everybody looked a little concerned when we got on the plane. <laughs> but, but it's a short flight, you know, from Oakland to, to Southern California. But anyway, we went down there and had a wonderful time. Um, they just were wonderful to us. And we had a full-day seminar. Ancestry was there. Suzanne Russo was there giving some presentations on how to get the most out of your Ancestry membership. And I was there talking on Google, as I usually do. So um, it was a lot of fun. And I think it was a real eye-opener to a lot of the participants of the things that could be done with Google that they, you just don't even know about. They don't advertise. So we uh, created our genealogy dashboard and did lots of other goodies as well. But they were so hospitable. We had a wonderful time, a wonderful evening having uh, dinner with some of the board members. It was a quick trip, but uh, kind of a nice girl time trip, actually, for Vienna and I. We went to a winery down there in Temecula, I think you call it. I think it was Thornton Winery. Uh, one of the board members had recommended it to us. And boy, it was fantastic. It was like going to France for an evening. <laughs> I mean, it was the sun was setting. They had live music outside. We were sitting in the courtyard of this beautiful French looking, you know, winery and having an amazing dinner. I mean, first rate. So that was fun. That was a very special evening just for us to get some t- some girl time before the baby comes. And then it'll be grandma time and, and she'll be busy trying to sleep as much as she can <laughs> in between feedings and changings and that kind of thing. So that's it for travels. Um, I'm pretty much going to be home, I think, between now and the end of the year. And then it will start back up in January, which, of course, I'll be, I'll be roaring and ready by the time January rolls around. Oh, let's see what else is new. Oh, I wanted to mention to you, you know, my book, Genealogy Gems, Ultimate Research Strategy, is available through lulu.com, and I have that linked to my website. I wanted to mention to you, you know, one of the downsides, unfortunately one of the few downsides with that site is they do a terrific quality of book and really fast shipping, but the shipping has always been pretty expensive. Um, typically over $5 to ship just the single book if you order it. Well, I just got an email from them. Lulu has reduced their shipping price to a flat rate, no matter where you are. Uh, for a single paperback order, it's three ninety nine. dollars So um, not dirt cheap, but definitely more reasonable than the, the shipping that you may have come across um, in the past in looking up the Lulu book. So it's a great time. And um, in fact, they're going to have some specials going on. So if I see those, I will make a mention of what the, you know, coupon codes or whatever they are in the newsletter so that if you'd like to get a copy of the book that you can get any discounts that are coming up for the holidays, as well as that new lower shipping rate. So that's nice. And I am, yes, I am working on a new book. I can't say what it's about yet, (laughs) but I am working on a new book. So I'm actually hoping to find a little bit of time in the next six to eight weeks um, to to really get that launched and hopefully finish it early in 2010. So stay tuned. I'll have more information on that. But something I did launch that is brand new is the Genealogy Gems Toolbar. Now, I think we have talked about the Google Toolbar uh, here on the podcast, but you know, I found a fantastic site that allowed me to create a custom toolbar just for genealogy gems. I understand that one of the things about listening to the podcast is it can be a little bit, you know, uh, confusing to get around either in iTunes or get to the website and find, you know, what the right episode is that you're looking for, that type of thing. This toolbar has a radio, like a media player on it. And I have loaded up, um, it's got a direct feed, both to three of my podcasts, the Genealogy Gems podcast, um, the Family History podcast, and Family Tree Magazine's podcast that I also host for them. It's free. You can just download the toolbar one time to your computer, and it will be there on your browser no matter where you travel 
on the internet, you're going to have that one little strip of Genealogy Gems toolbar across the top of your browser. And it will have the media player so that you will get the new episodes as soon as they come out. And you can listen to them right there as you're surfing. You know, you're surfing around the web and you can click on it and listen to it as you travel and do your research and, and things. But also it has um, dozens and dozens of the back issues so that you can go back and just select from the list which one you want to listen to. And I know that Media Player on the show notes page, it's a little trickier. You kind of have to um, hit that forward button and kind of scroll through and hope you can find it. This this is a bit easier. This is You're going to like this. I, I, can, I can guarantee you you're going to like it because... It's just one big long list. You pick the episodes you want. You can see the topics listed. And, of course, you're going to get the brand new episodes right away. But in addition, I had an opportunity to put what I call the gem sites. Um, This is a little button that you click on, and it has a list of all the major sites that we've been talking about on the show, some of the best free websites for genealogy that you'll find. Those are all one click away now by using the Genealogy Gems toolbar. And let's see, what else does it include? You'll see a picture um, of the family from the logo that's on the far left. If you click that, you are right there on the Genealogy Gems website. One click. Then there's a search box, which not only searches Google, but also searches the Genealogy Gems website specifically. And then there's a highlighter pen, which that is my favorite feature that's on the Google toolbar, and I was able to get it onto the Genealogy Gems toolbar. So you can actually highlight web pages that you're surfing on. And of course, then there's the media player. There is a one-click button to Genealogy Gems News Blog. Let me see here. If you click on it, yeah, this is so cool. You can click on it, and it's got a listing of all the most recent articles. Gosh, there must be two dozen articles here so that you can read through the subjects and pick which one you want. You can, oh, it tells you when it's posted, and you can even mark which ones you've already read. So you can kind of keep track of them that way. Again, it's just a really easy, quick way to get to the blog. And then you'll see a little button that looks like a TV set. If you hover over it, it says, watch Lisa's genealogy videos. One click and it will take you directly to the Genealogy Gems TV channel on YouTube with all of the free videos that are available there. And then you'll find a little Twitter bird. That's so you can follow me on Twitter and the things I'm talking about there. There's also an icon for Facebook if you want to um, become friends on Facebook or become a fan of the Genealogy Gems podcast. We've got a fan page there. Um, you can do that real easily. And then I do have it looks like a checkbox with a check mark inside of it. That is the Insider blog. That is Diane Haddad's Family Tree Magazine blog, and I just enjoy that one so much. And she really hears about things first thing. So one click and you're over there on the inside of blog, you can check out what she's doing. And then there's a little a shopping cart there that you'll see. And that actually will give you instant access to a couple of the different places that we have merchandise. You can go to the books and audio. So that click would take you over to lulu.com where you would find my book as well as the archived premium episodes that I'm now finally getting a chance to put online and make those available. And then there's also a link to Gems Merchandise, which is, um, oh, there's bags and tote bags and, and, and coffee mugs and all kinds of good things there. So you can get to that very quickly with the shopping cart button. Then there's the Gem Sites button, which, of course, I love. I, I think you're really going to enjoy having these sites so um, quickly available to you. And there's actually a message feature. And I thought about this one. I'm trying it out. I want to see what you think about it. But it says messages, and that gives me a way to actually instantly message you. If there is something, and I'm going to use this very sparingly, I promise. (laughs) But when something comes up, or a, a new episode, or a question, or that kind of thing, I'm looking for feedback, I can actually send you a quick little instant message through the toolbar, A little window pops up in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And if you want to message me, you can click Messages on the toolbar and reply back. So it's a really quick and easy way to be in touch. It doesn't allow for very much text. So like I say, this is really just kind of like quick notifications versus email. Um, But we'll see what we think about that. Um, The nice thing is 
we can try these things out and I can add features to the toolbar that will instantly show up on your toolbar. You don't have to reinstall it. I can also remove um, features if it turns out they're not proving it to be um, of real value to, to you guys who are using it. So I want your feedback on this. Check it out. See what you think. But anyway, I really wanted to make it super easy for you to find Genealogy Gems, get a hold of the videos, watch them, follow me on Facebook, listen to the show, and not have to be, again, surfing around and trying to find where everything is. Because the whole idea here is to save you some time and bring the information to you as quickly as I can. So very excited about the toolbar. So again, I want to mention to you, it's free. It's a one-time download that is super, super simple to do. And it will add itself to your browser. You can always take it off if you decide later you don't want to use it. But I think you will find a great value in that stuff. So I'm going to have the link in the show notes um, that will take you directly to the download page for the toolbar. Check it out. Give it a try. I think you're going to absolutely love it. And I hope that you will email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com and give me your feedback. And let me know maybe if there are certain features you've seen on other toolbars that you might like to see included on the GEMS toolbar. Well, in this episode, we've got a lot of great things coming up. Um, We are going to get the inside scoop from the head genealogist at the incredibly popular free website, FamilySearch.org. That's David Rencher, who is now the head genealogist. I had a chance to talk with David at uh, the Salt Lake City Family History Expo back in the summer, and we really had a chance to sit down and talk one-on-one about his new role there, but also his vision for what's going to be happening with the website and with the records that are being digitized. You know, he is really the key player when it comes to determining which records are going to be digitized and in what order, what priority that the records are going to be digitized. In the long run, they all will be. But you can imagine it's a long process and there's a lot of selection and um, decision making to be done. And he's the one who's doing it. He's also got some great insight into other tools and features that will be coming our way through Family Search, the folks over there, and some of his favorites. So uh, I think you'll get a lot out of that interview. But before we get to that conversation, I want to hear from you. And we're going to do that at the mailbox right after this. Do you have your Genealogy Gem rhinestone pin yet? Genealogy Gems podcast listener Pat Del Piaz does, and she's loving it. I love it. It's the perfect size. It has just the same amount of sparkle in it. I took your advice. I started a blog for my family. So I went through some papers and I found a marriage certificate and a baptismal certificate for my husband's grandparents. And I said, well, I'm going to scan these and put these up on the blog. And I set it aside to do the next day and I went to bed and I'm just drifting off to sleep. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, the baptismal certificate, my husband's grandfather's name is Jacob. And everything else that says James, and I couldn't figure out why. And it came to me that because the baptismal certificate was issued 25 years after the baptism, somebody had to transcribe it. And what they were probably looking at was his Italian name that he was born with, Giacomo, which can also be translated to Jacob or James. I'm so happy I finally have a reasonable explanation for why this says Jacob. So the next day, I put my genealogy gem pin on and went off to work. Everybody said, oh, you got a new pin? What's that all about? So I got to tell the story. So I was very, very happy. And I told everybody, I'm going to wear this pin every time I make some sort of genealogical discovery. So you ask me about it when you see me. Get your own genealogy gem rhinestone pin and get the folks around you talking. The pin is made with high-quality Czechoslovakian and Austrian crystals and measures one inch high and two inches across. It adds just the right amount of bling to clothing, hats, and purses. Tell the world that you're a genealogy gem today and get your genealogy gem pin at the Genealogy Gems podcast website at genealogygems.tv.
Well, here in the mailbox, um, I've got a couple of emails. First one comes from Megan Kaiser, and she says, Hi, Lisa, I am in the process of catching up on my podcasting, and I just listened to the Broken Branches episode. Um, She's talking about the recent Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, where um, I called the, the episode Broken Branches, and it was featuring my interview with Crystal Bell. She says, I'm sitting here at the computer with tears in my eyes. It was so amazing to hear that you can heal from and move beyond those broken branches. And she writes, I wonder if Family History Podcast might have a DNA episode someday. You're awesome. And oh, that's nice. You are awesome. And I love your podcast. My whole family listens in the car on trips. Yes, even the five and under crowd. (laughs) Thanks again, Megan Kaiser. Oh, Megan, I'm so glad that you enjoyed the Broken Branches episode. I loved working on that one. And Crystal is such an amazing woman and has a really compelling story that I think everyone can benefit from because we all have those, you know, broken branches and twigs and things in our tree. So I'm really glad that you enjoyed that. And in fact, I did cover DNA in episode 29 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I'll have a link directly to that in the show notes um, for this episode. Actually, I will be interviewing a DNA specialist for the November episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, which is going to be out uh, the second half of this month in November of 2009. So keep an ear out for that one. Thanks again for listening, and uh, tell that under five crowd that they are my youngest fans yet that I know of. (laughs) And uh, actually, Family Tree Magazine has a great site for kids. If you go to familytreemagazine.com slash kids, they have some really fun stuff. Thanks so much for writing, Megan. And Rhonda Schneringer from um, South Dakota wrote in and she says, I'm listening to episode 73 of your Genealogy Gems podcast as I type this. In this podcast, you mention a class you called Sharing the Joy. You describe it as projects that anyone can do to share your genealogical information with family members who aren't into genealogy yet. Can you tell me where I can find information about these projects? I'm new to genealogy since I retired early in 2009 and have listened to 40 family history podcasts over the past few months. They are terrific. Thanks so much, Rhonda Schneringer. Oh, Rhonda, thank you. Oh, my gosh, you listened to all 40 of them. (laughs) I know there's a lot of past episodes. I'm glad you're getting through them and picking up some gems there that you can hopefully find that will help your research. Um, So I really appreciate you listening. And as far as the sharing the joy class um, that you mentioned... Actually, the origins of that class really do come from this podcast, um, because I've mentioned a lot of the things that we talk about in class on various episodes, particularly earlier episodes of the podcast. But really, the details and all the information can be found in my book, Genealogy Gems, Ultimate Research Strategies. And let me kind of outline it for you. The projects that we talk about in that class, which I think are all easy to do. They're fun. You don't have to be, you know, Martha Stewart or some (laughs) ultra creative person, but they really take all that wonderful data that you're finding about your family and they're putting it in a form that the non-genealogists can appreciate and enjoy and hopefully it will generate some questions from them to ask you more about the family history. So the first project we did was a decoupage plate and that you'll find in chapter 11 of the book. And then there was the Sweet Memories Candy Bar, which is in Chapter 20. That was my favorite project. Uh, I think it's very unusual, and you won't find it probably anywhere else. But um, I had fun doing it, and we had some listeners send in some terrific um, kind of their take on the candy bar. Uh, And all the information and the instructions and everything is there in the book. And then there was Family History Wall Displays, which you'll find in Chapter 3. And... There was also chapter 13 covered publishing your own family history book. And these are kind of coffee table type, sit down in one sitting and read um, a segment of an ancestor's life, breaking, you know, the books rather than trying to cover everything in one book that's going to take you your entire lifetime to write. Why not get some of those sections of your genealogy research down in a book? So like I did books on... um, 
my father-in-law's naval years or my grandmother's nursing years when she first became a nurse and her experiences. So breaking it down to particular ancestors and particular stories. And we talk all about the best ways to kind of go about doing that uh, in Chapter 13. And I also produced a four-part video series for the last project, which I feature in the class, which is the Family History Christmas Wreath. And you can watch that at my Genealogy Gems TV channel at YouTube. Hey, if you have the toolbar, you just click the little TV set and boom, you'll be there. (laughs) Um, But there's four videos, parts one, two, three, and four that cover step-by-step how to create the Family History um, Christmas Wreath which I have to tell you, it never fails to be a conversation starter. Even for folks who come to my house who've seen it before, <laughs> they'll, they'll stop and they'll look at it again and ooh and ah and ask more questions. And it's just a great conversation starter. And Rhonda, if you do some of these projects, I would love to have you send me an email with a photograph. Take a picture of what it was you created. I mentioned in the book that several listeners have sent me photographs of terrific takes on these projects, kind of their own style and some of the stories about what it meant to some of the people in their family. And and that's just wonderful to hear. So I'd love for you to share with me what you do and pass that on to the other listeners because we can all kind of get ideas from each other, can't we? Are you looking for a way to get even more genealogy gems that will power boost your research, inspire your creativity, and give you the motivation that you need to tackle that brick wall? will become a Genealogy Gems Premium member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month, packed with great information that you can use right away, an instructional video series walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. Our current series is called Google, a Goldmine of Genealogy Gems, and in each episode, you can follow along with me as I show you online how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a premium member. But don't just take my word for it. Here's what your fellow podcast listeners have to say. This is Melissa Parker in Tennessee. I'm just calling to let you know how much I'm enjoying your Genealogy Podcast Premium Edition. I especially love the handwriting analysis with Paula Sassy. And all the tips and information that you give is just so wonderful. I would encourage anyone to become a member of your Genealogy Gems Podcast Premium. To become a premium member and start reaping the benefits right away, go to genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's save two zero, you will get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Well, as I mentioned, I had an opportunity at the Family History Expo in Salt Lake City, Utah, back in August of 2009 to to sit down and really have a one-on-one conversation with David Wrencher, who's the head genealogist for Family Search. And David has some wonderful insight to not only what is going on today at Family Search, but what he really sees in terms of technology and the future for not only Family Search, but for genealogists as well. Here's um, part one of my conversation with David Wrencher. I'm here at the Family History Expo in Salt Lake City, and I'm really excited because I have a very special guest with me today, and that is David Wrencher from Family Search. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. I enjoy being here, and it's a great show. It, it really is a wonderful turnout, and people are just buzzing around the halls and attending all the classes and getting to a huge exhibit hall here. Yes. Now, I know I wanted to jump right in because I know that you have a new role. You notice I didn't even use your title when I introduced <laughs> you because I want to make sure that I get the right um, title. Tell us what your new role is at Family Search. Um, I'm now the Chief Genealogical Officer. And with that role, uh, what we're looking at in sp- specifically is to make sure that all of our products are uh, genealogically sound and that they're doing what people would expect and and that we just maintain the high standard that we've had for many, many years. And we just want to make sure that we don't do anything that uh, wouldn't be in harmony with what uh, people would be expecting genealogy-wise. 
Right. Well, and and you do so many different areas. I mean, there's the maintenance of the films themselves. There's digitizing of records now. There's the the family history library where people can actually come and get their hands still on the real thing. Yes. And of course, the whole online presence as well as PATH users. And I imagine, do all of these genealogical pieces? fit into your puzzle? Or are you the one who's kind of wrangling them and keeping them more organized? Well, the pieces all fit into a puzzle, yes. yes. Uh, I'm not over all of those, mercifully. Okay. Um, but I do have a pretty significant role in seeing what records are digitized and the order in which they're dig- digitized. So with 2.5 million rolls of film in the Granite Mountain Record Vault, uh, as we digitize that collection, one of those films has to be first and one of them has to be last. Yes. And so we're prioritizing uh, the direction of how that collection will be digitized. At the same time, we're digitizing the book collection uh, in the Family History Library, and that's been going on. We now have over 40,000 books digitized and up uh, on a partner site, which we're using with uh, Brigham Young University and the BYU Archive, uh, Family History Archive down there. And that's just been a terrific project. That's expanded now to include other genealogical facilities around the country. Uh, We have book scanners going at uh, Allen County Public uh, in Fort Wayne. Wonderful. Uh, Same with uh, Mid-Continent in Independence, Missouri, and at the uh, Clayton Library in Houston, Mm -hmm. as well as several of the other um, uh, libraries that are part of the church education system, so BYU Hawaii uh, and BYU Idaho. Uh, We're doing a fascinating project out in BYU Hawaii. We're um, digitizing the records of the... um, uh, people from the Philippines who came to work in the Hawaiian pineapple plantations. I think I just read about that. Yeah, that's yeah. a real new project. It is. It's kind of fascinating. So, wow. uh, kind of, kind of really reaching out. Um, of course, all of the things going on with uh, uh, trying to provide a better level of service in the library, just create an experience there that's uh, engaging and that's uh, something that people want to do, and that we're of just the most help that we can be there. So, uh, the information age really has changed the landscape for us, and it's uh, it's a big ship to turn, to move out of a microfilm world into a digital world for us has been huge. Well, and I imagine as Chief Genealogical Officer, then, you're really keeping your eye on the focus that all of this is supposed to help us move forward on our research, right? right? Tell us about your background. How did you end up in this role? Well, um, I... I, uh, Graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in family and local history. And so I have been in family history for years and years and years. Um, Moved around within the department. Um, First worked in British reference and then moved into some more technical areas. Worked with microfilm circulation in the family history centers. Uh, But most recently, uh, at one point, of course, was the director of the family history library. And so just been trying to continue to keep a focus on um, what the members need. And so this role... um, really kind of brings all of that full circle and uh, really focuses me on uh, what the members need in particular and then uh, helps me work with other members of the department on how we're going to deliver that and what kind of presence we're going to have in which arena. So I think the burning question anybody watching or listening to this um, interview would be is, okay, David, how do you go about deciding which records are going to be digitized. We all have our favorites, our list that we would love to see. And um, what is the process for that? So the process is to put up um, records of high value. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to make it easier for those who are just beginning. And so many of those records are the more recent records. Mm-hmm. And so we are trying to cover kind of what we would call kind of the, the just the bread and butter records, the home plate records. So vital records, births, marriages, and deaths, the census records, um, church records, just kind of work down a, a progressive list like that. Um, we have a number of users who have covered all of those records, and they're into some of the more eclectic records that they need to piece together and, and, and break through brick walls. So things like tax records and, and census substitute records and those kind are a little bit further down the list, unfortunately, but we will get to them. And so we have a completely different mechanism to try and deliver those um, in, in terms of putting those up online. Well, people used to be very patient. They'd come in and they'd put a roll of film on and they would <laughs> crank down through 1,200 images, you know, patiently. They aren't as patient when we uh, put those online. They want the image that has their ancestor on it (laughs) delivered. And so that's required a whole new method and thought and thinking in terms of um, indexing and providing access to those records. Uh, It's given us a wonderful opportunity to begin to work with partners and other affiliates and to be able to uh, together 
put this information up or point people to the information. Uh, people really don't care whether we have the information or not. Uh, mm -hmm. They really just want the answer to their to their challenge or their problem. And so one of the things that we are trying desperately to do is to not only put up the records that we have, but point to records that would also answer the problem. And that's one of the things. I know when we go to Family Search, we're very used to just finding, it's kind of like a, a starting point or an ending point. I mean, it's right. really kind of an all-inclusive. And one of sometimes one of the frustrating things is that then you have to kind of go and figure out where is the website that has what you want. But, right. but you're building in components that are really going to point people. So if it doesn't reside on your website, then we'll still get information about where to go to to get that? What we're trying to do is to build with our partners at least acquire the index to the records that may be on a partner site. Okay. And that way when you do a search and you, and you come to that record in the index, we can then at least point you and say, we don't have this record, but it is at this site. The site may be a pay site, uh, there may be a fee attached to it, uh, but at least you know where the records are that you need. And right. so we can point you to where you need to go. So you're going to have the index. And well, we hope, we hope to. We certainly okay. are, are trying to uh, uh, get to a position where we can where we can do that and where we can at least help people understand where the answer to their problem may be. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that you are digitizing yourselves, those are going to go straight onto the Family Search website. The ones we're digitizing ourselves go up straight up onto the website with both an index uh, and an image, uh, or uh, what we call um, an access point, or think of it in terms of a waypoint, uh, as you would with a G uh, GPS device. Um, think of, you, you see this all the time, you see this functionality all the time on, on the web. You'll see a, a line of just the alphabet, A through Z, mm -hmm. and so you want the names that start with the letter R. Right. And so you just go to the R's. Now the R's aren't necessarily in alphabetical order. They may be, they may not be, but at least you're only looking at the R entries. Uh, and so we call that kind of a waypoint, and that just gives you, a, you don't have to sit there and start paging down from the A's <laughs> to get to yeah. the R's. And so uh, some of the records, church records, for example, are, uh, are a good case to, that we can waypoint. If we can, if we can get you to the record that you want, our first pass may be just to get those up online, say, okay, you can look at the christenings of this church in England uh, for, our, for the years 1800 to 1810. Mm -hmm. And then you're not paging down all the way through the, the whole roll. You're only paging down through the images for a few specified years. So uh, we're trying to make it, uh, we're trying to get the records up as quickly as possible make them as accessible as possible, and make them as usable as possible. And so we are, we're using a variety of solutions to do that. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about the Family History Library catalog. Uh -huh. And I'm assuming that much of the digitizing you're doing are going to be things that are already cataloged on, yes. the, on that site. Yes. What happens to the catalog? And is that going to change? Or is everything that's already there linked to these new uploaded images? Boy, what a great question. Um, I don't know what the ultimate uh, uh, vision is for the catalog and what it ultimately will look like. Right now, of course, it is the basis for our uh, collection. Um, right now, for example, with the scanned books, if you go into our catalog and we have scanned a book, it will say right there, right there. in the record, to view a copy of this book, a digital copy of this book, click here. Um, well, we can begin to do those same kinds of things with our other film and, and those types of things. We may be able to come up with a better um, uh, access or, or thought process. Uh, we may come up with a, a better geographic approach to the catalog, still using that as the underlying foundation for mm -hmm. how we get to the records. But the interface, I could easily see changing. The interface to the right. catalog is, is kind of ar arbitrary and, and is uh, library oriented. We're really trying to shift our collection from being more uh, uh, locality first focused and being name first focused. And so we're trying to get you to the names you want because it tends to be how people think. Mm -hmm. uh, they think name first and then they think locality. And many of us who've been in genealogy for a number of years, we, we may not remember, but we actually had to train our minds to think locality first right. and then name. And so that's been a, that's, some of that untraining uh, has been a little bit uh, challenging. That, that's great to know because I know I rely on the catalog because I feel like even if I can't access online, I know whether or not it exists. Right. That's half the question, isn't right. it? It's just, it is. does this I even really exist? I really enjoyed talking so, with David okay, Renter, well, that's good. the we'll head genealogist at Family Search. And in part two of my conversation with him, we're going to talk about the opportunities that technology has posed for the genealogical community as well as for Family Search. 
And you will hear from David what he believes is the most powerful genealogical tool on earth. So stay tuned for that. That will be in episode number 76 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. When I was growing up, Christmas was a time that my grandparents came to visit. My mom was always baking, and because I was the youngest, I would get to put the star on top of the tree. And now as a mom and a soon-to-be grandma, I love shopping for the perfect presents for my family. Online shopping makes that task so much easier because we literally have the world at our computer. This year, you can get your shopping done, have the gifts delivered to your door, and support this free genealogy podcast all at the same time. If you enjoy these free shows and you'd like to help me cover the costs of bringing them to you each week, there's a really easy way that you can do that that won't cost you a thing. Here's how it works. Let's say that you need to get something at Amazon.com, one of my favorite places to shop. Go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click the Amazon link or use the Amazon search box. And no matter what you buy, you financially support the show. The price you pay is exactly the same, but Genealogy Gems receives a small percentage for referring you. It's just that simple. And if you're going to be loading up your iPod or the iPod of someone you love this Christmas, just click any iTunes link on my website. And again, your purchases will help make this podcast possible at no additional charge to you. So if you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast and family history, genealogy made easy. Let your mouse do the shopping through the ads and links on the Genealogy Gems website at genealogygems.tv. And together, we'll keep new episodes coming for a long, long time. Thanks so much for joining me on this 75th episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. And to stay in tune with everything going on here at Genealogy Gems, I invite you to sign up for the free e-newsletter. Head to genealogygems.tv and click on the sign up button there on the left hand menu column and you'll get a couple of emails a month letting you know when new podcasts and free videos are published and what's going on in the genealogical world as I'm hearing about it, as well as a couple of extra gems that I come across. I like to put those in the newsletter as well. Again, it's free and all you need to do is just provide an email address and a password and promise honest I never share your emails with anybody else. And as a thank you gift for signing up for the newsletter, you will receive in your first email a link to my free 20 page ebook. It's Google Research Strategies for the Family Historian, and it's like a huge cheat sheet. You're going to love it. It's got all kinds of great techniques that you can use to better fine tune your searches. And as always, if you'd like to contact me, you can do so at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or better yet, leave a voicemail on the voicemail line at 925-272-4021, and we may just have your comments here on the show. So thanks so much for joining me for today's episode, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 